It's been a while since I made a video in this series, and since you all love my video on the ugliest motorcycles from every manufacturer, I figured we should take it one step further and look at the absolute worst motorcycle in each manufacturer's history. Also, I'll try not to forget Royal Enfield this time. I mean, it's not like Royal Enfield has ever made a bad motorcycle. So strap in, get your fingers ready to type your complaints when you find your motorcycle on this list. Really quick though guys, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you may have noticed that I've never done a sponsored video. Now that's mainly because I just haven't had many brands or companies reach out to me that I thought would be worth promoting or representing, and I've always wanted it to just be something I really like. So that is until today. So this video is officially sponsored by De Agostini Collectibles. De Agostini is a company that has been making high quality scale models since 1959. And the way it works is you simply subscribe and every month they'll send you pieces for the model that you pick and you build it along with literature that comes. So for example, I'm currently subscribed to build the Valentino Rossi Yamaha YZR-M and you don't just get parts and instructions to build the bike, you also get literature talking about both Rossi's career and the bike's history and significance. But in the end, after you've been building it every month, you end up with this amazing 1 4th replica scale of the bike with a stand. These are incredibly realistic. They have moving and working parts. And the first 100 people to sign up using promo code promo underscore V Rossi will get this free Bluetooth speaker. So it's really cool, and if you guys like this kind of thing, definitely check out the link in the description below and see what you think. I'll put the link right at the top of the description, and I'll also pin a comment so that you guys can get to it easily. Big thanks to De Agostini for sponsoring this video, and let's jump right in. We're going to start where we did with the other videos in this series over in Germany with BMW. Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you. It was easy to find an ugly BMW motorcycle, but in reality, BMW has not made very many bad motorcycles. They manage to always be competitive with whatever class that they're building a bike in. They're very reliable, and of course, BMW has probably the best service out of any company. But there is one motorcycle that does really stick out to me. So for this one, I have to go with the BMW R1200C. And it's not necessarily because this bike is horrible in and of itself, it's just the overall attempt from BMW to make a compelling cruiser that was just completely out of touch. Now you might know of the most recent R motorcycle from BMW, which was the R18, another somewhat misguided attempt at making a cruiser, but at least that bike looks the part. This bike, yeah, this bike is bad. So this came out in 1997 and it had a decent run, about 40,000 units were sold of these machines that were produced and roughly 38,000 of the 40,000 were immediately taken to the junkyard upon arrival. I mean, what is this thing? It's like a bad interpretation of what cruisers will look like in the future. The specs aren't great either, though it is a big bike. It only weighs 565 pounds wet, which is not that bad for a cruiser in this sort of segment, but it only makes about 60 horsepower from a 1200 cc engine. I mean, that's really no better than a 1200 Sportster from this time, and it's actually heavier than a Sportster. So if we're gonna try to compete with Harley with a bike like this, you have to make it look the part, and if you're not gonna make it look the part, you have to make it perform significantly better, which this bike just didn't. But more than anything, which prospective Harley buyer is ever going to go out and consider this thing? I don't know who bought this. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. If any of you out there ride one of these or any of the bikes on this list, please chime in down below and try to convince me that I'm wrong. All right, next up we have Ducati. Now, companies like Ducati are interesting. They're almost the opposite of BMW in that their bikes are just sort of heartbreakingly beautiful, but not always great. Now, many would point to the 999 sport bike that came out after the 916 and made Ducati so embarrassed. They essentially have been trying to make a 916 over and over again since the 999 came out. But in many respects, that was a forward-thinking bike and really was a good bike. I'm going to give it to the original Ducati Diavel. And I would like to include all Diavels for all time because these bikes are just weird and ugly and awful to me and I don't really get the whole Diavel thing. It doesn't feel very Ducati, but more than that, the original Diavel was a bit of a disaster. It came out in 2011 as, in many ways, a successor to the Ducati Indiana. Now that's a whole different story, but 
Essentially, this was an attempt from Ducati to enter the power cruiser market started by Harley's V-Rod, and the idea of a cruiser built around a superbike platform, in contrast to Eric Buell's program, which was to build a sport bike, or a superbike, around a cruiser platform. Well, it isn't all bad in theory. The problem wasn't that it was and still is hideously ugly. The original Diavel just had technical problems. Ducati decided to load this bike up with lots of new, untested technology, and because of that, it had endless reliability problems. Now, much of that has been worked out on this bike, and, you know, I have to give it to them. The Diavel at this point really does sort of stand out in the market, but, you know, I personally just don't love it, and, you know, I guess it does well for Ducati, but I never see these. Like, I see people on Ducatis all the time. I almost never see people on Diavels. Anyways, I pick the Diavel. Next up, we have Honda, and this is tough because in spite of the fact that Honda has made so many fantastic, iconic, game-changing motorcycles, cycles over the years, their boldness has at points led them down some sort of goofy roads. There are a few examples that on the surface appear bad, the EZ9 for example, or the TR200, just goofy weird bikes, and though the TR200 was a misguided attempt at, you know, cashing in on a very niche market, the EZ9 really is sort of a cult classic and it reigns supreme as the ultimate pit bike for paddocks across the world. For me, the worst Honda ever made was the CR450R, a much anticipated anticipated big off-road race machine that looked the part entirely but was ultimately lacking severely in one area, the area that Honda rarely lacks, that is the engine. Instead of a true purpose-built 450, this was just their 250 off-road platform bored out to 431 cc's paired with a lazy 4-speed gearbox instead of a 5-speed. The chassis and the suspension weren't much better. Overall, it was a disaster. It had zero success on the racetrack like they hoped. And thankfully, Honda made up for it the next year with the bike that the CR450R should have been, the CR480R. So, you know, it's good that companies like Honda can just fix these problems quickly instead of just keep making bad products like some of the other bikes on our list. All right, let's head back to Italy for another Italian motorcycle manufacturer who has had their fair share of flops. Now, I think for the ugliest MV Gusta, I talked about the 604C, but in all, that bike wasn't really bad. It was just very weird and ugly. Now, I'd say the worst MV Gusta by far was the Rivale, MV's rather weird attempt at making a Supermoto-esque bike, and it ultimately almost killed the company. MV isn't the type of company that could afford to make a bad bike, and in the end, there just was not a market for this. The Hypermotard was such a success for Ducati, but it wasn't like there was a whole new segment for these kinds of bikes, especially in the US. The Hypermotard was, and still kind of is, an anomaly, and MV thought that they could do something similar, and they were wrong, and because of that, their most recent CEO said this about the Rivale. Um, last Supermoto that Envy Augusta did almost killed the company. So, so far, this segment of the market is not big enough for us to consider developing product into it. All right, Suzuki. And man, so many great iconic bikes have come out of Suzuki, but quite a few flops as well. But the TM400 Cyclone probably takes the cake not only for the worst, but arguably one of the most dangerous motorcycles of all time, and this, this is probably the worst bike on this entire list. This bike followed the slogan, Injury Forces Sales, more than win on Sunday, sell on Monday. A completely untamable, unpredictable power band, woefully inadequate frame design, this bike was the real Widowmaker. And still, Suzuki just kept making it year after year, horrible as ever, and that's probably the worst thing about this. It wasn't just that they made a dangerous bad bike, it was that they kept making that bike year after year and people kept buying it because they mistakenly thought it was a race winning bike. Now some say the legend is overblown about this bike and how dangerous it was, and maybe it is, but it got this reputation for a reason. Many riders were seriously injured or killed on what could only be called an off-road death trap. It's almost unrideable. Most will say, having ridden this bike, that it is not only difficult to ride normal, it's almost entirely impossible to ride competitively. All right, next up we have Moto Guzzi, and this is really tough for me because Moto Guzzi has released both limited production and full production bikes that are incredibly weird from the MGX-21 and MGS-01 and the V10 Centario. I mean, there's so many different Moto Guzzi's over the last, like, 70 years that are very weird. I mean, take that V10 bike. That was a purposely designed cruiser sport bike mix. So weird, right? But oddly admirable. 
But of all the Italian manufacturers with a reputation for bad reliability and even worse service, Moto Guzzi is probably at the top. It's also difficult to pinpoint one specific model because for the most part, they're all just the same bike with the same power plant. Once Moto Guzzi hit their stride with the big flying V-twin, that's basically all they ever made. So I'm going to leave this one to you guys. Let us know down below what your experience has been with Moto Guzzi and what you guys think is the worst model so far because I don't really have a specific model that I can pick out, especially from the last, again, like 40 or 50 years because they're all basically the same, at least in terms of, you know, the structure of the bike. It's not like Honda and other companies who go out and take risks and try different engine configurations. Moto Guzzi just basically does the same thing. All right, on to Yamaha. I'll be honest, there's probably quite a few other Yamahas that could be on this list, but for me personally, I have to give it to the Virago. And I know this is going to offend some people, but just hear me out. The Virago in and of itself is such an ugly bike. <laughs> but more than that, it's the first in a long, horrible line of Japanese cruiser bikes meant to look American. Yes, some of which and many of which are better than the American bikes that they're trying to copy, but I just don't love this whole trend starting in about the 80s. Now, sadly, this bike actually does have a great power plant. There are still Viragos rolling around today with loads of miles on them, and they're really cheap. So if for some reason you want like the Sportster look from, say, the 80s, or 90s, this is a really good option because you could probably pick one up running for like 1500 bucks. They are good bikes, they were forward thinking bikes in terms of a lot of aspects, but when it comes to the design and the influence on other Japanese companies to make these kinds of bikes, for me the Virago just hasn't aged well. But more than anything, it's just not Yamaha to me. And that's why, thankfully, Yamaha doesn't attempt these kinds of bikes anymore. For me, when the Japanese brands are looking forward and creating new markets and not copying other bikes and trying to just make money, that's when those companies are at their best. And this bike is the opposite of that. Speaking of American cruisers, we made it to Harley. And boy, this one's tough. There's been quite a few bad apples in Harley's history, but I have to give it to the Street 500, one of the worst attempts at pandering from Harley-Davidson in its long checkered history of pandering. These were like a Dyna that you bought off Wish.com, except they still cost like seven grand. Now, I talked about these bikes in my recent video on Harley, but seriously, if you see one in person, it's like the Harley designers let their teenage children design the bike. It kind of looks like a Harley, and in pictures, it looks okay, but from the proportions and the build quality that you see in person, it's just not there. I will say though, it does keep one aspect of the Harley DNA, and that's the performance. One of the heaviest 500cc motorcycles you could buy, and also one of the most underpowered. This is supposed to be a beginner bike, and the thing weighs right around 7,000 pounds dry and makes like 4 horsepower. All I'll say is just buy a Rebel. And you know, that's why they got rid of this bike, because it wasn't competitive and it wasn't good. Next we have Kawasaki. Now many point to bikes like the H1 and H2 Widowmakers, and for sure those weren't the most complete motorcycles, but they're legendary sort of cult classics because they were so fast and so rowdy. But they weren't truly bad in the sense of being rowdy like the Suzuki that we just talked about. For me, I don't like putting audacious motorcycles on this list. It's the duds that we don't want to see from brands, especially like Kawasaki. I certainly could go with the Vulcan. That bike has been and kind of has always been a bit of a turd, but I think I'll go with something else. This is one of the oddest bikes Kawasaki ever made starting out as a power cruiser with a modified version of the Ninja's inline four engine. Now you could say this is audacious, I guess, so maybe I shouldn't put this on the list, but for me, it's just weird and misguided and I don't like it. <laughs> That's right, it has an inline four sport bike engine in a cruiser sort of form. Over 15 years or so, the Eliminator would take on many forms and engine configurations. I'm not sure exactly why this bike came to exist, I mean, these have their fans, of course. I'm not just sure who's interested in riding, you know, a sport bike in cruiser clothing. But that's what this bike is, and yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> okay, for Indian, it's pretty difficult. Their history isn't as long as some other companies, as they were out of production officially for quite a while. But it's actually during those years between the first Indian and the Indian that we have now where some weird stuff went on. There isn't one specifically bad Indian that I can think of in history. Their classic and vintage bikes were some of the best in the world. And today, Indian has been consistently making great products. I think I'd rather pinpoint an era for Indian. Indian has had quite a few eras of just bad products in between the two main sort of 
versions of the company. For me, the worst would be the pre-Polaris Indians of the 2000s. These bikes just didn't have the fit and finish and quality and reliability of the either the originals or the products that you know have come out since Polaris took over. They were almost there, but they weren't great. But I almost want to say it's a different type of bike from Indian. And for me, I think it's their more classic cruisers, if you can call them that. I don't know. I think it would have been cool if their bikes looked less like giant Harleys and more like actual classic Indian cruisers of, say, the 30s and 40s. Bikes like the Scout, for example, they're great, but they really have nothing to do with, say, the original Scout 101. Okay, so I'm doing the same thing where I'm not actually picking a motorcycle. So I'm just going to pick a motorcycle. I'm just going to say the Chief Vintage. There you go. That thing is a gaudy, bloated, almost offensive motorcycle that hurts my eyes to look at it. I'm sure it's fine, but that's my pick. <laughs> Next up, we have Aprilia, the final Italian manufacturer on our list. And yeah, there's been some bad Aprilias, but I'm going to give it to the classic 125. You know, classic for Aprilia because it's pointing back to a period in Aprilia's history where they made motorcycles like this. Yeah, they've never made motorcycles like this. I don't know what this is. This is a terrible half-assed attempt at cashing in on a market that they completely do not understand, and that's why it lasted one year, because it turns out nobody in the States wants a 125cc liquid-cooled two-stroke wannabe cruiser. This bike is not true to their brand, and it's not a well-executed attempt. I mean, the Virago was at least a proper cruiser that did most of the stuff right for Americans. I mean, it's essentially a better sportster from its time, but the classic 125 is just bad in every way, and that's why it went by the wayside, and thankfully, Aprilia, you know, at this point at least, gets their own market and their own company identity a bit better. I don't foresee a cruiser coming out of Aprilia anytime soon. All right, we're on to KTM, and man, KTM might not make my favorite motorcycles, but as of late, it's hard to pick out a truly bad bike from them. They are true leaders in multiple classes from off-road to adventure to naked and hyper-naked. They make stripped-down, lightweight, fast, fun motorcycles. What's there not to like? You know, I mean, the weirdest thing I could find was a series of scooters made back in the 50s, but it turns out those were really innovative and actually, you know, some of their first truly home-built KTM engines. So you can't pick on those scooters. So I'm going to go a little bit of a different route for KTM. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that actually I think KTM's current MotoGP bike is one of the worst KTMs ever. KTM is a competition brand. They dominate every single area that they compete in except for MotoGP, which I know is a hard task. But for whatever reason, as of late, especially this year, they have not been able to find hardly any measure of success while other companies like Aprilia have. Now, it doesn't seem to matter who's on it. It's not going to probably matter if Jack Miller's on it next season. That MotoGP bike bike just isn't competitive with the Japanese inline fours and the other Italian V4s. They did have a measure of success in their first few seasons, but since then, all of the bikes have been updated, including Honda. They've revamped their machines, and at this point, the RC16 feels like it's just way behind. Race after race after race, KTM is just not even in the mix. Not to mention that one time that I rode it, and yeah, it felt a bit underpowered. Next up, we have Triumph. Now, since Triumph made their comeback in the 90s, they really haven't had too many duds, some unappealing bikes for sure. Lots of bikes that haven't aged all that well, but I think from Triumph, you have to go back. And arguably the worst of the worst of classic Triumphs goes to the oil and frame bikes. That's right, the oil was housed throughout the frame instead of in a separate oil tank. And this leads to all sorts of problems. This started in 1971, and for some reason Triumph just kept sticking to their guns and kept making them when they could have easily jumped back to their traditional system after everybody got upset. At this time, the British marks, they knew they had to innovate, and often they just innovated in all the wrong ways by doing stuff that riders don't really care about instead of focusing on the important problems plaguing their bikes. But the gist is this. The system did not work great. Lots of foaming in the oil meant that you couldn't always fill the oil drain pipe up all the way. Like a lot of times you can only fill it halfway, leaving the bike entirely under oiled, which would lead to all sorts of other problems. Also, the seat sat way higher than the Bonnevilles before it. 34 inches was the seat height for the oil and frame Bonnevilles in the first year. They did sort of correct it over the next few years, but that's almost four inches higher than the previous generation. Imagine that. Your favorite bike, let's say you've owned a couple of them, the new model comes out, and it's four inches taller 
This made the bike only fit for riders over six feet tall, and it also made the bikes look a bit off and just, yeah, not work for shorter riders. And that was really the problem. Then, of course, the Bonnevilles started kind of looking like cruisers. Ugh, and then the entire appeal of the Bonneville as the great British sort of roadster was just gone. These bikes really were the beginning of the end for Triumph, as the final Bonnevilles of the 60s really were sort of the peak of their success. All right, we've come to the last company, the last on our list, also a British company, Royal Enfield. Now, this one's tough because Royal Enfield are and have always been a kind of good-bad, you know? full of character and personality, bikes that sometimes truly are fun little bikes, and at other times, you know, they feel like they have a lot of character because they're just problematic and unreliable and even sometimes cheaply built. Now, for a very long time, Royal Enfield basically just made one motorcycle. They did have an awesome history and an awesome past where they made lots of cool bikes, but, you know, prior to the new twins for, I don't know, like 40 years, they just basically made these big singles that I would say, I don't know, they sort of mark a dark period in Royal Enfield's history. Not necessarily through the 60s and 70s and 80s, but more the last big singles prior to the twins. Those bikes, ugh, the company just had no new life and no energy before Siddhartha Lal came in and basically made Royal Enfield what it is today. Those big singles, whether you want to call them the Bullet or whatever models they were, they were just getting so outdated at this point. Sure, they'd gotten updated with fuel injection, but that's pretty much it. Bikes like the Classic 500 and 350 prior to 2018 were the personification of a motorcycle manufacturer straight on its way out. Unwilling to try new things, unwilling to take any risks whatsoever, those were bikes that truly were like 50 years behind their time, and Royal Enfield brilliantly got themselves out of that place and started making compelling motorcycles for the first time in like 40 or 50 years. So in the end, it was good. Those last bikes were bad because they forced Royal Enfield to basically do what they did. But man, that company was straight on its way out. All right, guys, there you have it. The definitive final list of the worst motorcycle from every manufacturer. As always, let us know down below if you guys have any thoughts. I'm sure this will lead to quite a bit of discussion, and I'm sure a lot of you probably think I'm wrong about most of these, but this is just for fun, and I'm willing to learn, so tell me what you think. All right, we'll see you guys in the next one. Ride safe.